fear is such an interesting thing. It can be helpful for keeping us safe. It's not a bad thing, fear. It's, it's a helpful kind of natural reaction, isn't it? It can be helpful. We should listen to our fears. But it can cause unhelpful emotions and decisions. It can make us make a rash decision. It can make us micromanage. It can make us get all kind of paranoid and things like that. So fear can be very unhelpful. And I think the opposite of fear is understanding. What we really need to get, we shouldn't just forget about our fears completely, but we need to understand our fears and we need to start asking ourselves these big, deep questions. And there are different answers for every one of us. Questions like, what are your greatest fears? Do you actually know that? Have you ever named it? Have you ever told anyone? It's very helpful and very powerful. And then the other question is, what are your false fears? Is there anything you're worrying about all day and all night, which maybe is even like the bears, it's hibernated, it's a false fear. These are quite personal questions, but I'd really encourage you to explore them because it can make such a difference to us in the long term. So, we made it through Russia. Eventually, after three long, hard months, we made it to the coast of Russia, and this is me on a ferry going town to Japan. And I was so excited to go to Japan, I thought, finally, I'm going to escape from all of this horrible Russian winter weather. But this was Japan when I arrived. Still lots of snow up in the north. We started to head south. Um, we were quite worried about Japan because we'd heard it was a very expensive country. Has anyone ever heard that? It's a very expensive country. So, and we, we didn't have a lot of money. Our life savings was about 10,000 US dollars to last for three years. So we didn't have a lot of money. So we were really worried about the expense. But then my friend Al had this great idea. He said, no, 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 Japan is not a very expensive country as long as you never buy anything. And so we, we, just, we just lived in our tents, um, we lived in the parks, we ate very, very cheap like ramen noodles, and um, it wasn't too bad. And we, we got headed south, it started to rain, it started to warm up. Um, but this photo, even though things were getting easier, and we're smiling here, this photo was taken a couple of days before me and Al decided to split up. And there were a few reasons for that. Why, why did we split up? There were a few reasons. One, we had cabin fever. You know, we'd been stuck together for four months. We would sort of needed a break. But we didn't need to split up for good, but we did split up for good. Another reason was we wanted to take different routes. I wanted to take a sort of detour, as you'll see. Al wanted to go straight back. But the third reason, I think the most important reason, was that I realised that Al was always being the brave one. He was always being the one with the bright ideas that got us out of trouble. And I realized one of the deep motivations for this trip, for me, was personal growth. I wanted to grow. And I knew I could only grow if I faced the challenges by myself. Because I think that is the best way to grow, is to do something difficult, to do our very best at it, and we grow so much. So onwards I went now, all by myself, down through Japan, got a ferry to South Korea, up through South Korea there, just me and my bicycle, and then from South Korea, another ferry across to China, and um, I should point out that's not me, I haven't been collecting bags. Um, I mean, China was great, it was the summer now, so I got down, um, lots of friendly people, made it down to Hong Kong, I'm sure some of you will have visited Hong Kong, and um, great city. And I think sometimes when people hear about adventurers, they think we're the kind of people who just push ourselves all the time. You push yourself through one obstacle, another obstacle, another one. You're tired, but you keep going, keep going, keep going. Well, that is sort of true for an adventurer. You have to push yourself even when you're very tired. And on a short expedition, you just push yourself every day. But on a long three-year expedition, it was essential that as well as pushing myself, I also practiced self-care. And I think it's something that's easy to forget when we think about resilience. One of the key things of resilience is just looking after ourselves, being sensible and wise. And in the business world, um, I don't know what it's like here, but in Hong Kong, everybody, we all work way, way too hard. Everybody works hard. Sometimes people burn out. Sometimes people make bad decisions because they're so exhausted. And it can be very, very counterproductive, actually, to work too hard. I think there are some quite obvious 
things that we actually teach our children, but we forget to practice ourselves. Things like sleeping enough. The science shows if you get less than seven hours sleep a night, your performance starts to really deteriorate on a consistent basis. If you only get five hours sleep a night, um, you're making decisions in the same way you'd make them if you were clinically drunk. So uh, if you get five hours sleep a night, maybe get a bit more. Um, exercise. We, we all know we need to exercise. You only need to exercise for about 10 minutes a day of intensive exercise, and it keeps you quite fit. We don't need a lot of time for that. Um, diet, obviously, eating reasonably be safely, um, and screen habits. I think this actually affects a lot of the sleep one, because we check our email all night, and we check it in the morning, and we check it you know, every 15 seconds, and it distracts us, it makes us inefficient, it stops us having good ideas, and it makes us more exhausted and scattered and worried. So these obvious things um, are very, very uh, important in life. On an expedition, I took breaks, like in Hong Kong, I took a break, I stayed with a friend. But now, I was planning on a new challenge. I was starting to get the hang of things. I started getting the hang of things in China. And I thought, I need a new challenge to face by myself. So I'm not just going to ride straight home. I'm now going to try and go down to Australia. But I don't want to fly in a plane. That would be far too easy. I want to get there just overland, so that meant there's a lot of water to cross, no ferries, so I started to hitchhike on boats. So I found a boat from uh, Hong Kong to the Philippines, and then from the Philippines, I went down through Indonesia, down to the mysterious island of Papua New Guinea. Has anyone been to Papua New Guinea? It's, it's a few people. It's quite an adventurous place. Just before I got there, I received an email from a British guy who lived there. And he said, I should warn you that travel in Papua New Guinea can be quite dangerous. I've been held at gunpoint and robbed 16 times and have been caught in crossfire from warring tribes using M16s and the like. Don't want to be negative, but I'm sure you'd want to make informed decisions on where you travel. Uh, I was terrified, but I wanted to embrace the challenge. So into Papua New Guinea I went. There were jungles, that was the first big challenge. I started to get lost in the jungles. So uh, then I moved to, down to the, to the sea and I thought maybe I can go beside the sea and that meant I had to push my bike along the beaches, which is really hard work. Sometimes I made friends like these, that's Yagi and Anderson. Um, Anderson had a huge knife so I felt a bit safer and they showed me a way through the jungle. Sometimes I had to find canoes across the river, walk through rivers, walk through the sea, or just, that's John, walking across these swollen rivers. And to be honest, I really felt like giving up sometimes, because it was so hard. And it, it raises that question of perseverance. How do we persevere when the going is getting tough? And Something that helped me was before I was a high school teacher in the university summer vacations, I used to be a door-to-door -door salesman in America, knocking on doors, selling children's books. And it was a really interesting job for me, learning knock, 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 and you're trying to sell these books to all these families in America. And one day when I was knocking on doors, I was having a really bad day, and I didn't sell anything. And I sat down on the curb, and I just felt like quitting. But two things came into my mind, two things my sales manager had said to me. He said, Rob, don't think about the sales, think about controlling the controllables. What can you control? And then he said something else. He said, the answer to all your problems, what's the answer to all your problems if you're a door-to-door -door salesman? It's behind the next door. You can control that. You can't control the sale. You can control knocking on the next door. So I got up and I knocked on the next door. No sale, next door, no sale, no, no sale, no sale, no sale. I kept on knocking on doors, and after about an hour, I got a sale. My mood lifted, and I had a great, great summer that year. We can control the controllables. On an expedition, I can control the controllables of just keep going, going off the 10 miles, going off the 10 miles. Things will get better, things will get better if you keep controlling that. Eventually, I made it through Papua New Guinea. You can see there, at the end of the jungle, my shirt is ripped, my hair's a mess, my beard is long, I'm dirty, tired, and hungry, but I felt great, I'd made it. Now, to the capital of Papua New Guinea, Port Moresby, just there. I needed one more boat to get me to Australia. And I thought, uh, I, I had three weeks left on my visa. So three weeks, one boat should be possible to get to Australia. So I, first of all, I went to talk to the yacht clubs. I asked, are there any yachts going to Australia? He said, sorry, 
it's typhoon season. No more yachts for three months. You can't get a yacht. Then I went to see the shipping companies. Uh, they were very friendly, but they said, we're sorry, but it's uh, lots of laws, lots of red tape. We can't give you a lift. I couldn't get one of the big ships down to Australia. Those are my two best ideas. And I thought, well, if I can't find a boat in the next, well, I've got about two weeks left now, my only choice will be to buy a plane ticket. But that'll be a real shame, because I'm trying to do this trip without planes. And I thought, well, let's just say I have to get on that plane in two weeks' time. I want, at the very least, I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and tell myself I tried everything I could think of to find a boat before I got on the plane, then at least I won't regret it. So now I started to go networking crazy. I'm quite shy naturally, but I forced myself out of my comfort zone and I started going to lots of dinner parties, as many as I could, and I'd meet everyone I could and I'd say, oh hi, uh, by the way, do you have a boat going to Australia? And everyone was very friendly, but they said, oh sorry, don't have a boat. Um, I managed to meet the British High Commissioner. He was very friendly, but he said, oh sorry, I don't have a boat. And then I I even went on Papua New Guinea TV on the evening news, and I gave an interview on the news. At the end, I said, oh, by the way, I'm looking for a boat to Australia. Can anyone help? Nobody got in touch. I was really running out of ideas now. But to tell you what happened next, it was quite a surprise to me. I have to go back in time one year previously to when I was in Shanghai, up at the top of the map. When I was in Shanghai a year previously, I'd met a guy called Ed, who was traveling in China, and he said to me, when you get to Hong Kong, you should meet this guy I met there. He's a guy called Angus. So a few months later, I got down to Hong Kong and I met up with Angus. Angus couldn't help me with my, with my journey, but he did say, you should meet my colleague, Julian. Julian used to work in Papua New Guinea. Now he works in Hong Kong. He might be able to help. So I went for a drink with Julian. Julian couldn't really help, but he did say, you should meet the guy who took over my job in Papua New Guinea. It's this guy called uh, Pete. Uh, he's really nice. So a few months later, I finally got down to Papua New Guinea, went for a cup of coffee with Pete, and I said, oh, can you help me with a boat? And he said, I can't help you with a boat, but next weekend, I'm having a tennis party. Do you play tennis? And I said, oh, a little bit. I might meet someone there with a boat. So I went to Pete's tennis party. There I met his friend Sam. Sam introduced me to his girlfriend, Felicity. They were both very nice, but neither had a boat. And then Felicity said to me, my friend Helen, she teaches in the local international school. The kids there would love to hear about your adventures. Why don't you call her up? I called her up. She invited me to the school. I went in. I gave a speech to a group of eight-year-olds. And at the end of the speech, I said, by the way, everybody, I'm looking for a boat to Australia. Can anyone help? No one said anything. I went back to where I was staying, really thinking I was out of ideas. But then the next morning, Helen phoned me up. She said, uh, little Ashley in the second row, his uncle has got a luxury dive boat with an empty luxury cabin, is going to Australia on Saturday, would you like a lift? And I said, you bet I would. And so that's how I found my ride to Australia. But how did I really find that ride? Well. Maybe there was a bit of luck involved. And I think it's helpful to remember in life, luck is a factor. I'm not denying that luck is, you know, we all recognize sometimes we've been lucky, sometimes we've been unlucky on our path. Second thing was perseverance. I kept going through all those different contacts. So helpful in sales as well, isn't it? Referrals, following the referrals. A third thing, which maybe um, is again quite obvious. Um, I, I saw this um, documentary the other day about Warren Buffett, you know, the fifth richest guy in the world. And in, in, it, in, in the documentary, it talked about how he was good friends with Bill Gates, the richest guy in the world. And once, soon after they became friends, someone got them both to sit down with a piece of paper and write down the one word that they thought was the secret of their success. They both wrote down a word. Then they showed the word. It was the same word. Do you know what it was? It was focus, focus. That's so interesting. Those guys must have a million things to do every day. But they said the most important thing for them was focus. And that links into being, having clear goals. On an expedition, it's easy to have clear goals. I knew I needed to get to Australia. That's what focused me. That's how I got there. But in the business world, it's, it's kind of harder because there's lots of different things you're doing. But it's so important to be able to focus on the key things. Again, avoiding the distraction of 800 emails a day or whatever it is, being focused. And then the last thing, is collaboration. 
working with other people. I sometimes say, even though on my trips I'm on my own, I can't make it on my own. I need to ask for help. I need to find other people on the way. Um, there are so many clear ways we can do this with our colleagues, um, with finding wise advisors and getting a coach at events like this, networking and meeting each other and sharing ideas. That's so helpful. Um, also, friends and family. Uh, that's really, really an important part of our long-term success in life is our, our friends and family helping us with that. And do you know what I think maybe holds us back from collaboration more than anything else? It's fear. Again, it's that old thing. It's fear. What's the worst that can happen if you email somebody you respect and ask if they can be your mentor? The worst that can happen, they might say no. You can find somebody else. If you haven't got a mentor, make sure you find one. So, down to Australia, we're really going to just head, head to the end now. I went round Australia, and one thing I realised in Australia, there's me fixing my, my bicycle, one thing I realised was that, to my, kind of to my surprise, but I was very happy, I realised I had got better. Through taking on challenges, I had learned how to become an adventurer. I had learnt how to fix things. I had learnt how to get through all these difficult situations. And having that belief in our own ability to learn is such a key thing, especially in today's world where there's so much learning resources online. It's kind of free. You could kind of teach yourself anything these days if you just focused on it. And here's a great question I, I, somebody asked me the other day. What is the top skill which, if you mastered it, would double your value in the workplace? There's a good question to focus on. Here's the second question. Do you believe you can improve at it? It's a yes, no answer. The answer should be yes, because, of course, we can learn any business skill if we put our minds to it. The third question is, how will you improve at it? These are really career-changing and life-changing questions if we take them seriously, um, focusing on that skill and then doubling our value. So... Onwards now to the end. We've got a boat from Perth up to Singapore, up through Southeast Asia, through Tibet, down through Nepal, into India. Hooray, everyone was playing cricket. It was brilliant. Um, so I was very happy. Um, and I went down, met loads of great people. They'd invite me in for cups of tea, give me that great food. Um, very, very beautiful country. Very hot, slightly crazy traffic, I have to say. But it was a lot of fun. And I had a lovely, lovely time in India. And then I, I, went, I cut through Delhi, headed up north to Amritsar. You'll recognize the beautiful golden temple there. And then uh, across the border into Pakistan, then slightly crazy through Afghanistan, um, survived that and uh, um, into Iran and then finally home to London and um, past Big Ben, it was raining of course when I got to London and up my street and home at last. And just before we finish, a couple of, a couple of things I wanted to say. First of all, I think when we take risks, sometimes there are unexpected rewards as well. We have to take some risks in life, don't we? Even doing nothing is taking a risk. And when I got back from this trip, I'd taken some risks, but I wasn't really thinking of making a career out of it. I thought I'd go and be a teacher again. But then, to my surprise, National Geographic got in touch. They asked if I'd filmed it, and I'd sort of self-filmed it, and so they made a TV series. And then a publisher got in touch and asked me to write a book, so I wrote my first book. Suddenly, I was a professional adventurer, and so since then, this was about 10 years ago, I've gone on all sorts of other adventures. This was last year. I walked across a massive desert in western China, having loads and loads of adventures. Uh, but the best thing that happened was actually when I was in Hong Kong, cycling through through Hong Kong. Uh, one day I um, went to a party and I sat down next to a beautiful girl and we got on very well. We stayed in touch. She went to work in London. She was still there when I got back. So I married her. I even met my wife to be on that trip. Um, you never know what unexpected rewards you might get when you take a risk. And so we're just going to wrap up. What did I learn? How did it change my life? But really, this story is not about me. It's about you, because your life is also a mad expedition, isn't it? You've, I bet you've been through some crazy ups and downs in your life. Everybody does. You've had ups, you've had downs, you've had everything in between. So what did you learn, and how could it change your life? These are some of the things we've thought about. Understand your fears. Practice self-care. Persevere through controlling the controllables. Remember, we can't make it on our own. 
Learn through embracing challenge and calculated risks lead to unexpected rewards. You have been a wonderful audience today. Thank you very much for your time.